Hello and welcome to 3ABN Today Live. My name is C.A. Murray and allow me please on this very fine evening to thank you for sharing this part of your day with us and to thank you for your love, your prayers, which you know are coming and are out there, and for your support of Three Angels Broadcasting Network. Our job, our goal, our mandate is to spread the gospel throughout the world and without your help, without your love, and your prayers, we could never do that. So thank you once again. I, you will forgive me because I am excited this night to the point of delirium and distraction. Um, a number of things are happening. First, let me take an opportunity to introduce my guest to you, who we've just been talking a little bit. He was here once before. I had a chance to interview him. Uh, man of God, man of faith, um, Pastor Pablo Goya, good to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm yeah. glad to be here. This is a really neat guy hailing from Romania, but making his home here in the States, pastoring here in the United States, but who has just a fabulous testimony of what God can do when you surrender your life through him. The book that we're going to be dealing with that's part of Pastor Goya's life is called One Miracle After Another. It is by, uh, published by the Adventist Review, and it is an incredible collection of stories miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle that God has been pleased to, to, to bring into Pastor Goya's life um, that have followed him throughout all of his years. And when you read this book, you are made aware that God is very, very present in our lives. And, and there are times when the Lord, through, through his own choosing, selects people and uses them to his glory and brings miracles into uh, their lives. We begin to unpackage his story, though I think we'll go to a little music. Uh, this is a good friend of uh, this ministry. Uh, his name is Tim Herb Hebert, and uh, his brother, Tom, actually wrote a song that is on my CD. Uh, this is a good singing family, a ministry family, and uh, this fellow has a powerful voice, a powerful witness, a good Christian, and he's going to be singing A Love Called Grace. He speaks my name, looks in my eyes, and without shame never denies this mortal man he could replace, but he gave love the love. Sometimes I fail, I'm just a man. I know someday I'll see his face because of love, a love called grace. This grace has known millions of souls, and we His grace still grows. Yes, everyone can stop and see that with His grace we are set free. Please speak my name, look in my eyes, and without shame.
Amen. Well done. A love called grace. We got just one quick prayer request I want to go to mostly because of uh, the age. Um, we're being asked to pray for Don Gabriel. He's 92. Uh, his step son or daughter is writing to us. Been running from the Lord all his life. And that is a prayer request that I will take personally and add to my list. Uh, having have a, 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 a father-in-law who's 91, I know God can do it at any age. And so we will be praying for Don. I, I guarantee that. Pastor, again, good to have you here. You are from? Lexington, Kentucky. Kent Lexington, Kentucky. Now that accent belies that you didn't start out in Lexington, Kentucky. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you started out a little east of Lexington. Where are you from originally? Romania. From Romania. You know, it, before I get to your personal story, you said something very interesting about Romania, because I asked you before, did you, have you gone back, you know, and, and how things are a little tougher now economically, even than when communism was there. But you said something that caught my ear, that when back in the days of communism, when you came to the border, there were two things that they were trying to keep out of the country, and they were? Bibles. Bibles. And uh, pornography. And pornography. So when, when they stopped you, they checked no Bibles, no pornography. So they wanted to keep both out of the country, which, if you were caught, would give you the tougher penalty. Bibles. The Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Bible even tougher than pornography, which I thought is very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Now, with, with the fall of communism and with the free market and everything coming in, um, you can get Bibles in. Absolutely. But you, pornography is also there, too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How interesting that in a time that was godless, the country was societally pure because they kept these other things out. Now with the doors open, everything comes in. You can bring in the Bible, but the devil has come in also. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about growing up. You grew up in an Adventist home, didn't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my father was a very committed uh, man. He loved the Lord more than I can say in words. Mm -hmm. I remember him praying all the time. I don't know when he got to sleep. <laughs> and I remember him extremely committed to the church, mm. working for the church. He would come from work and then go to church and do something for the church. Mm -hmm. And he would visit people, do Bible studies, take care of the choir, take care of the church, mm -hmm. be head elder, do construction for the church, fix wow. the broken things in the church. He was dedicated. When it was something to build, something to buy, he would always give up the money we had in the house. Mm. And he would say, God would provide for us. Mm -hmm. And I remember this sentence, God comes first. Whatever we have belongs to God. Mm -hmm. We come secondly. So you grew up in a culture of a really sacrifice for the Lord. Absolutely. And, and your parents practiced what they preached. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, was that the first generation of Adventists in your family or does it go back further? It goes back to my grandfather. Aha. Uh -huh. My grandfather used to say that if we love God more than anything, if we make him first in our life, he's going to bless us and the blessing would go to the next generation. So he would say to my father, make sure that you, to pa you pass on the blessing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, what, what he actually did, and my wife and I try to do the same for our children, mm. to pass on the blessing. Pass on the blessing, praise God. Now, we're talking about growing up in, in communist times, though, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah, so your father, your grandfather, were, were making really incredible sacrifices because uh, what they were doing certainly was not supported by the government. Oh, no. Yeah. You could not buy something for the church. The church was not allowed to buy a chair. Uh -huh. You would need special approval that would take months and years mm. from the government to buy something for the church. So mm -hmm. the church members would have to donate. Wow. Wow. So all of this work, all of this time was really at a sacrifice. What would have happened to them had they been caught doing all of these things for the church? Probably beaten or going to prison or... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you, did, did they have a church building to go to or were they meeting in homes? Oh, we did have church building. You have a church building? Yes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we did build a new church inside the old church. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, we worked just during the night. Mm -hmm. No lights, no noise. Wow. We didn't use any power tool and we didn't use any light so nobody could catch us. Mm -hmm. And people didn't come together. People would come separately, one by one, mm -hmm. and get quietly inside and start working. And you'd get used with the night moonlight with or moonlight. whatever. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we'd start working around 12, 
a.m. and finish around 4, 5 a.m. A.m. And people would take turns. Uh -huh. And they build a church during the night. An entire church building inside of a church building at night. At a certain point, the new walls started to be taller than the old, the old walls. walls. Yeah. <laughs> so eventually, <laughs> police came to the gates of the church. Mm -hmm. We had the gates locked. So they uh, got a... Um, however you call it, the paper that you can break the gate and get in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, uh, my father asked the whole church to stay by the walls when they wanted to demolish the church. Oh, wow. And uh, he talked to them and he said, if you want to des destroy this church with the bulldozers, you are going to go through human flesh. Mm, incredible. Ourselves, our wives, our children. Mm -hmm. And you don't touch our church. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask this, because it, it was not illegal to, 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 to have a church. But was it illegal to attend church or illegal to No, it attend? was not against the law to attend church, uh -huh. but it was against the law to build a new church. Ah, uh -huh. so they didn't want you expanding your building. Mm -hmm. Could you go out and do evangelistic meetings or try to get other people to come? One-to-one, um, -one, you could talk to people, but to do mm -hmm. evangelism, no. Okay, so you couldn't have any kind of public, public campaigns. And yes, we did every once in a while, but... Mm -hmm. Now, what was the, the, recognized, the, the majority church? Was it the the Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church? Eastern Orthodox. Mm -hmm. Which gave you more trouble, the state or the, 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 the dominant church? Both. Both, yeah, yeah. So uh, left hand, right hand, both hit from both sides. But the church still grew. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you grew up in a home really seeing people sacrifice for the Lord. Mm -hmm. When did Christ become personal for you? Pavel, one on one. Well, there are a few steps, a few levels, I would say. Mm -hmm. First, uh, as a child, remember my mama, my mother and my father talking to me, telling me stories and teaching me how to pray and how to trust God and make him a priority. Mm -hmm. For instance, the teacher would say, because we had school Saturdays, the teacher would say, you have to come to school Saturday. So I would go home and ask my father, should I go? And instead of saying yes or no, he would talk to me and make me choose. Mm -hmm. And he would say, who do you think should come first in your life? Mm. And I would say, I think God. And he would say, okay, if you don't choose God, what happens to you? I would say, probably I lose my salvation. Mm. Now, okay, if you choose God, what do you think happens to you? Probably I have trouble in school. Now, which one is more important? I think it's, it's more important to have God. Mm -hmm. Which one is going to affect your eternity? And then he would say, what do you do with the trouble in school? I said, I don't know. He said, what do we do every time? Well, you pray. Then what do you do when you have trouble in school? I pray. I pray. So you put it in God's hands. You don't mm. take it in your hands. Mm. So he would lead me through the process to teach yeah, me how yeah. to think for myself. Yes, yes. He allowed you to work it out for, for yourself. What kinds of, I use this term, hot water did you get in by not going to school on, on set? Oh, I got in a lot of trouble. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The teacher would uh, isolate me in a corner and had me take every day a difficult quiz that would go not just behind all the lessons, but ahead of your lessons. Mm. And if she would catch me not knowing something, she would give me an F. In that time, the grades were one to 10 and she would give me a one or a two. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Extremely poor grade. Yes. And uh, I mean, she would call me names. She would say that Adventists do this and do that, all type of bad words mm -hmm. and make fun of me in front of the class. Mm. Now, how old are we talking? How are you uh, during this time? How old are you? Second grade. Oh, young. Mm -hmm. So you are suffering for your faith at a very, very early age. And I would go home crying and my father would say, should you cry because you have a wonderful God or you should be proud and happy? I should be happy. Mm -hmm. Then why do you cry? Wow. And he would tell me stories like the three young men in the fiery furnace. Yes. And he says, where do in the Bible do you see them crying? <laughs> <laughs> and he would, <laughs> yeah. and he would well, say, there yeah. is nothing wrong with crying. But when you cry because you are joyful, it's something. Mm. To cry because people talk about you loving God, mm -hmm. there's, there's no reason to cry. Wow. <clears throat> so I would go back and tell my teacher, you know what? I'm happy I believe in God. Wow. And she would say, God doesn't exist. We come from monkeys. So it crossed my mind and I said to her, well, you may come from a monkey. I am coming from God. <laughs> <laughs> you said that to your teacher? <laughs> she was very upset. I would think so. Praise God. Your dad must have been a very wise and dedicated person. Absolutely. Yeah, 
Yeah. He so very early on you are you're you're putting it out there for the Lord. And and I suspect those kinds of traits developed so early in your life stood you throughout your life. And, and of course, having read your book, uh, I know that is so. Uh, because the Lord, along with doing a lot of miracles for you, also put you in a lot, allows you to be put in a lot of testing situations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you got through grade school. Did you have a plan as far as, because I know you've had a lot of careers, you've done a lot of things uh, in preparation for, for, for ministry, um, and we'll talk about that too, but going through school, did you have a direction somewhere you were wanting to go, something you wanted to do for your life? When I was four years old, <clears throat> before school, I was in the church when somebody from the union came and gave the sermon in our church. Mm -hmm. And he talked from Jeremiah 29, 11. Ah. <laughs> and he said that God has a plan for every yeah. single one. The yeah. problem is that we have our plans and we care so much for our plans that we, are, we don't care about God's plan for us. Mm -hmm. and he has a general plan and then a daily plan for our life. And we should pray enough that we follow every day God's plan. Mm -hmm. So it got into my head. So I got out from the church when the church was over under the tree in the middle of the front yard of the church and started to pray, God, if you have a plan for me, would you please show me the plan you have for my life? Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, my friend, my good friend, his name is Pitsy. So he comes to me and says, what are you doing here? I'm praying for God's plan for me. I said, well, if you pray in the front yard, people are playing, talking, you cannot have quiet time. Come inside, we eat together. He lived right there. and. So I got into his house, I prayed there, we ate, and then <clears throat> I asked uh, his father, how does God talk to people? And my father was there too, and my father says, well, he has many ways to talk. One of them is through his word. When mm. you study the word, he talks to you. Yes. So I prayed again and then took the Bible, and I knew that I could not read. So I just opened the Bible and said to my father, read here for me. And... Um, it happens that it opened at Jeremiah chapter one. And I remember specifically asking my father before asking him to read, can God have plans for children too? Mm. And he said he has a plan for every single one. That is powerful. So I asked him to read Jeremiah chapter one. It was exactly the verse that says, don't say I'm a child. Mm -hmm. oh, oh boy. Because I'm gonna send you and you'll yeah. speak for me. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of them. So, um, I closed the Bible. I, God wants me to be a pastor to speak for him. That's my job. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to do. So now this, this all happened before you could read. Absolutely. So you're a, a small child. Four years old. That's, that's very mature thinking to be, to be so young. So the, the, the trajectory, I use that term, was set at that early age that you're going to give, live your life for God. I need to ask you this, Pavel. Obviously, your father was very, very dedicated to the Lord. Did you ever feel growing up that you were in a restrictive home or that you were, there were things you wanted to do that you couldn't do? Or did you settle into your faith very early? And I think I almost know the answer to that question. I settled in the faith very early. Yeah, yeah. It didn't feel like restriction. I felt that I, I was one of the most blessed child ever. I think mm -hmm. I had the best childhood possible. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously your parents loved you and loved love the Lord. No question. Yeah, yeah. So the, the torments, the things that, 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 that happened at school didn't, didn't bother you so much? Not much. Yeah, praise the Lord. No, and <clears throat> there were many, many stories, many incidents, including in high school. Many times they wanted to really to get me in trouble for not going uh, in Sabbath to school. Mm -hmm. And every single time God did Fantastic miracles, every yeah. single one time. Yeah. See, I, I was thinking about that because children can be so cruel when you're different. You know, you're, you're, we're all going to school and say, here's this guy not going. And, and uh, you know, to stand out at that age is, is pretty, pretty tough. Um, so all throughout your schooling, you had to deal with this Sabbath issue. In fact, all classmates respected me so much for this. And in the army, uh, they would fight e each other, they would uh, beat the weak ones, they would break into everybody's uh, briefcase and still they never touched me or my things. Mm -hmm. they, would, uh, they would be afraid, they would say, this man has a strong faith, don't touch him because he can curse you or he can bless you. <laughs> 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 so when they had trouble, they would come to me and ask me to pray for them. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Is there anything that stands out in your early years, before we get on to some of this other miracle stuff, in your grade school years, your high school years, where God really sort of stood up for you and, and, and because, you, you, you know, there's a, this history of miracles. Anything that pops out in your mind where God really just sort of drew the line for you? There are quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. Quite a few of them. One of them that was in high school with the glass. Mm -hmm. I was going to school and working too. Mm -hmm. I wanted to buy myself a motorcycle and uh, so I started to work early. And uh, is the miracle is in the book. It's yeah, that's, that's one of the first. And I didn't know you were still in high school. I, I thought you were a little older, but uh, tell us that story because it's, it's a great story. The whole glass idea and sitting out there, it, it's, it's just a really wonderful story. Um, <clears throat> I had a small shop of cutting glass and my father taught me how to cut glass and I did have fun cutting it. I mean, I could do anything, almost anything with glass. Mm -hmm. And I was working for a, a company that, it was called mandatory. Uh, that doesn't mean what it means here. It means you didn't own the business. Ah. You worked for them and you'd get after uh, expenses, you would get so much of the profit and the government would get so much. Mm -hmm. And basically you got about 40% and they got about 60% mm -hmm. after you take off all the expenses. Okay. And <clears throat> um, they asked me to come Saturday to work. And uh, I'm trying to make the story a little, the story a little shorter. No, take shorter. your time because it's a great story. It's, it's, it's a great story. Uh, basically, they said that people who uh, fix their homes or they built a house, during the week they are at work. Just weekends they have time for themselves. Mm -hmm. So if I am not there Saturday and Sunday, I miss the greatest opportunity to make money for the cooperation, mm -hmm. for the institution. So their job is to keep you working because as you work harder, they get richer. I mean, they, they want to keep you working. Exactly. Yeah. And <clears throat> I told them I made more money than many other, the other businesses that were there in that cooperation. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I make like twice money than the others make for you. I cannot come Saturday or Sunday. And I said, uh, if you want me, I come Sunday. Before that, I didn't go Saturday because it was Sabbath and mm -hmm. Sunday because nobody worked, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had two days. <clears throat> and I said, I would be glad to come Sunday. Mm -hmm. And they said, not good enough. We want you to come Saturday too. Mm. And I was trying to explain the president that um, Sabbath is, is my day to worship God. Mm -hmm. And uh, God and church is important for me. And I tried to explain him, I am willing to work harder and longer every day, a few hours. Just I cannot come Saturday. The man got really angry. And he said, nobody ever said no to me. Mm. Don't you know how much power I have? I'm, I'm in the CC, that was the central committee. He was not in the CC, but in every city they had people that were over the Communist Party. Uh -huh. And he was one of them. So he, <clears throat> those people that were in the Communist Party, they had a lot of power. Mm. And they didn't have a lot of respect for the others. I see, yeah, yeah. So he said, don't you know what I can do to your life? And he said, I can ruin your life. You come, if not, I'm going to destroy your life. And I said, listen, I cannot come. And you gain nothing if you ruin my life. But if you let me work the rest of the week, I will work harder for you. Mm -hmm. He got very angry. He lost his temper. He started to scream. He, um, his face changed totally changed, you would not recognize him. Mm. And he said, I will make you come. And uh, I could go on and on cursing and the words, we don't use them, but the words he said, you would not even want to hear. Mm. And <clears throat> so he said, I'll make you pay for it. Mm -hmm. I'll make you not just work Saturday, but go further than that. And yeah. just let, let me just stop you right here and ask you a question. This guy obviously has the power to make or break you. To, to make your life heaven or, or hell, to destroy you, you have made an enemy. Were you afraid at that time? Did, did fear ever enter the equation? This guy's screaming and cursing, he's going to destroy you. What's going on in your heart right now? Afraid, nervous, what? In, in, in that time, at that certain point, I was not afraid. Mm -hmm. I didn't even realize what he can do. But 
what happened next made me be a little afraid and mm -hmm. wondering what am I going to do next, yeah. you know? <clears throat> because I would have to go to the storage, we called it the deposit, mm -hmm. once a month and get myself glass, big, big, big boxes that had sheets of glass. And uh, that would be what I would have to use and cut and... Anyway, every time I would go to the storage, to the deposit, Inside there was fresh, nice, new glass. Outside, there were a few boxes of glass that were stored improperly. And the winter and the spring and the summer hit them. And the rain and the snow mm -hmm. made them that the water would go between the sheets and then the sun would hit. And it made like a white powder between the sheets. Uh -huh. And they were not usable. And they were like 22 sheets of glass like glued Together, like, so they like one big brick from sitting out in the weather. Welded together. Yeah, yeah. And there were a few boxes that stayed there for a few years. I don't know how long. Mm -hmm. But years, not, not years. days, years. And yeah. even the box, the wood box, mm -hmm. was rotten. That The finger could go almost in the bottom of the glass, not the top, but the bottom that was on the ground. Yes. You could destroy the wood. It so was just rotten. Rotten. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So nobody would take them. Everybody sure. would take the new glass that was deposited properly, stored properly sure. inside. Inside, yeah. <clears throat> well, one Sabbath, when I didn't go to work, he had somebody bring from those boxes and put them in front of my shop. And so when I came to work Sunday, because I started to work Sundays, just to make him happy, mm -hmm. the glass was there. And he pretended, he came and said Monday, he said, when I brought the glass, it was good. Uh, but because you are not here, the door was locked. We didn't go into your shop, and right now the glass is ruined. Now, everybody knew yes. that that glass was ruined for a long time before. Yeah, from years of weather. But nobody yeah. had the courage to stand up and say something. Everybody was quiet. Yes. And he said, you have two options. He said, first option, you come Saturday to work, and it's gonna disappear, and we give you good glass, and you have no problem. Mm. You don't come Saturday, you have to pay for this glass. Wow. Or go to prison. The law was that if you missed money in your shop, either you put the money or you go to prison. Okay. Well, the value was, I don't remember, around 12, 13,000. That was a lot, a lot of money, of money for yes. us. A lot of money. Yeah. So he's got you over a <laughs> barrel. Either you, you, you come to Sabbath and I'll make this problem disappear, or you're going to jail. Yes. Yeah. Moreover, he said, even if you come up with the money, I'm going to make you, give you another one and another one until I will make you beg me to work Saturday. That's not going to go away. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I didn't know what to do. I went home and I started to pray that God would solve the problem with the glass. And my father... Uh, called me and he said, what is the matter? And I remember specifically after I told him the story, he said, well, what are you planning to do? Hmm. And I said, what do you think? And he said, no, I want you to tell me what you want to do. And I said, uh, I don't want to work Saturday. And I said, okay, so what is next? Well, I'm going to pray. And what can God do for you? And I said, he can deliver me. Hmm. And what if he doesn't? I said, well, Marty's lo lost their lives, so uh, probably I would have to su suffer. Mm -hmm. And my father said, and if you would allow it, what do you think you are going to do? And I said, well, Joseph was in prison. Probably God can use me there. Mm. And so we had a conversation, and he said, are you ready for it? And uh, we prayed together, and my father said, be kind, be polite, be respectful, but if you made a decision, stand your ground. Yes. Don't be afraid because you have a powerful God. Mm -hmm. So I remember going back to him and talking to the president, <clears throat> excuse me, and saying, you can ruin my life or you can let me go free and I will work even harder. But I'm not going to come Saturday. Mm. So you do whatever you want. I made up my mind. And you were prepared for whatever consequences that statement was going to bring on you. And I said to him these very words. I said, if God wants to save me, he can save me. If not, I'm willing to go to prison. 
I'm willing to lose my life for God. Wow. He said, you don't know what you talk about. For secondly, and when he said, you don't know what you talk about, he said, you don't even know how prison is like. You are going to be sorry. And then he said, secondly, there is no God who can save you. You said, if God wants to save me, there is no God. I want to see God. Where is God? Show me God. And he started to scream, hey, God, come here. I want to see you. Do you have the courage to talk to me? Come here. Mm. And then he said, you see, he doesn't come. He's not going to come for you. Mm -hmm. There is no God. I want to see what God can deliver you from our hands. So I went back home and I told my father how it worked. Mm -hmm. And my father said, now it's not about you anymore. Right. Now it's about God. Very true, because he, he affronted God. He was beyond you. <clears throat> he looked up and, and, and shook his finger in the face of God. And my father said, yes. now this is yes. the way you've got to pray. Mm -hmm. Don't ask for deliverance and don't ask anymore even for strength that you prayed before. Mm. Ask that whatever happens to you is not important anymore, but ask that God's name is going to be glorified because there are a lot of people there Yes, yes. that heard that statement. Mm -hmm. Pray that those people will know that there is a God. Amen. Your father is a very wise, wise man. So we prayed and then I prayed a lot myself and I said, God, you know what that man said? Mm -hmm. Make those people know that you are a wonderful God mm -hmm. and you are real. Yes. See, that's the kind of Pharaoh, statement that Pharaoh made in, in, in Exodus 20. Who is your God? Who is this God that I should obey him? You know, and when you make that kind of statement, you really kind of, uh, to use modern language, you're kind of calling God out. You know, you're kind of, God then is going to have to introduce himself in such a way as to get you to understand who he is. So he, your father was right. He did take you out of the equation. Now it's between that fellow and God. You are just the instrument through which God is going to work. He, he took a little longer time to explain it to me. Mm -hmm. He gave me the example of Moses. Ah. He said when, when people build, made a golden calf, mm -hmm. Moses went before God and God said, let me destroy them. And Moses didn't say, oh, just forgive them and bring them to the promised land. Moses said, they are a stubborn nation. They deserve to die. Yes. But what are the nations going to say about your name, mm -hmm. about your promise, yes. about your love mm. that you cannot deliver? So do it for your name's sake, for your glory. Mm -hmm. And my father said, now it's about God's glory. Wow. And he said, pray that God's glory is going to be bright and clear for everybody. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Powerful. So he said, forget yourself. We are not important. It's about God right now. Mm -hmm. So I remember praying that prayer. And... Uh, I went back to the president and somehow I talked to the president and I said, listen, this is what I, I want to do. I will not come to work Saturday, period. This is not going to change. But if you allow me to bring back the broken glass and get new glass, I'm going to work day and night and make you the money that you want. You tell me the number and I'm going to make you the money that you want. And he smiled and he said, <clears throat> hey, Whatever you do, I win. Because he said, you take this glass back, you are going to pay for it. You mm -hmm. don't pay for it, you go to prison. If you manage to take it back, you are going to work for me. I win either way. You don't work the, the way you, I want, you are going to come Saturday. And uh, probably he knew, the way he got the glass there, he knew that the glass cannot be transported. Mm -hmm. So basically, I got... A driver, his name is Nietzsche Vasile, paid him and the driver came with the truck and the truck had a small crane, very small, like, a, like, a, like an arm. Oh, um, right. And the, the boxes of glass were 220 meters long, 180 tall, and 22 sheets of four millimeters thick each one. This is big. This is a big box of glass. It's, Absolutely. Yes, yeah, very large. 22 sheets of glass inside. Mm -hmm. Extremely heavy, extremely mm -hmm. big. Yeah. In the wood box had like two shoulders, one here, one here. And you'd put one cable here, one cable here, and then... Hook it from the middle. Hook it from the middle. And pull it up. Pull it up. Yes. Rotate. And put it down. Put it down yes. in the truck and it would have to stay vertical. You could not incline it. Probably the way he transported it, it was inclined to, because the bottom of the box was rotten. It was rotten, right. It couldn't it hold the weight, sure. But I was not allowed to do that because when you put it horizontally, the glass would crack. I see. So it has to stay vertical. It has to stand up, yeah. So the driver put the cables and when the crane lifted up the glass, when he started to rotate, 
the bottom of the glass, the, the, the bottom of the box, the box yeah. broke. And the glass, several tons of glass just came out. When those tons of glass, the bottom breaks and they go out, nothing could stand under and stop them. Yeah. It would kill anybody. Yeah, the next In fact, thing is that several people, if they try to stay under, it would have killed them. Kill them all, sure. You're talking, you're talking tons of glass of weight. Yeah. I didn't even have time to pray. Yeah. Because somebody may say, what did you do? Nothing. The glass stopped in the air. So here is the box. Uh, here is the glass. And the box is moving empty, light in the wind, mm -hmm. and the glass stands still. And it's like the earth stood still. Mm -hmm. People are walking on the street. They stopped. The driver is like stopped moving, stopped breathing. The president, the secretary, all the ladies that were working there, all the people that were working there, everybody stopped moving. Mm. I was looking and I could not believe what I see. And my knees started to shake. Mm. It was something beyond imagination. Yeah. I, now, folks, I want you to get the picture because when mm. I read this in the book, I had to stop and, and work on the visual because you've got a crate full of glass, tons of, of, of weight of glass. The bottom of the crate falls out. And then the, grass, the glass, instead of falling out, slides out halfway or so and then just stops. So there's nothing supporting that glass because the bottom of the crate has fallen. So basically, the Lord has suspended the glass in the air uh, and it just won't fall out. It, it, it defies credulity, you know, that God would, would do this kind of very public miracle. Uh, and as you said, you didn't even have time to pray. Um, uh, what, I don't even know what question to ask, except what was the expression on the people's faces? What was going on at that particular time? I cannot even describe it. I thought before, before this happened, I thought if it breaks, I don't have the money to pay, I'll go to prison. And I, I pray God, uh, please do something that you, your name would be glorified and do something that I will stay strong. Mm -hmm. But it didn't cross my mind that anything like that could happen. Probably I thought God would intervene and uh, get me out of prison or mm -hmm. it would not cross my mind. I could not even imagine that. So I was looking to people and everybody was kind of pale. And this is very strange. I cannot describe it. It's like everybody was frozen. It's like everything was stopped. Nobody would even blink. Nobody would move. Mm -hmm. They were like, it's, it, like, they could not believe. They could not even think that it's real. Mm. And I remember for a few seconds, it was quiet. Nobody moved. And then the driver looks to me and he was yellow, pale. And he says, what do you want me to do? <laughs> oh, praise God. Yeah. And what? I said, yeah. I, I don't know. Mm. I, I just, I said, I don't know. So he went to the, however you call it, to the crane back. And yeah. he lowered the box. A little lever, yeah. Just, and yeah. you imagine the box coming down and the glass going in. Going in. So it just sat back down on the glass. The glass was oh, my frozen and the box would go down until all the glass got back totally in. And then together went down. So this happened in the air? In the air. Ay, ay, ay. The glass was standing there, yes. not moving. And the box lowered itself back over the glass. Exactly. Until the, all the glass got back in the box. And then when the glass and was together, back... Together, they went back down to the ground. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's enough to make your knees knock. Yeah. And the president was, this is enough. Please leave. Please don't work here. You are free to go wherever you want, to do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You don't have to bring it back. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to work Saturdays. Just don't curse my family and myself. Mm. Never curse anybody in my life. But anyway, right. yeah. he said, just yeah. please go. I don't want you to work in this institution anymore. I want you to just go wherever you want. You are free. You don't have to pay for anything. You don't have to do anything. Hmm. Yeah. My goodness. I just, it, 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 it kind of gives you chills uh, when you think about it. The, the, it is enough for the glass to be suspended in midair, but then when he's lowering it, the glass freezes itself and the box settles back down on the glass and together they go back down to the ground. That, 
<laughs> at the end of the day, what did, you, what did you go home and tell your dad? I was in shock. I told him, and my father smiled, and he told me one of his stories. But I said, I cannot believe that God would do that for me. And my father said, well, there are two things that you have to remember. First, that it was about God's name and his honor. Mm, mm -hmm. And secondly, that he says, I give nations for you. I give people for you. Yes. He loves you to the point that he gave his son. This is nothing. Mm. Mm -hmm. Incredible. And it's true. It's, it, it's about God's honor and God's name. Um, excuse me. So you... Did you continue working or did you take his offer and, and leave that particular job? I moved to a different place, uh -huh. still doing glass. Yeah. I, I moved from there. Yeah. Now, let me ask this. How old were you at this time? Somewhere around 16, 17. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did that particular incident change your mind as to what you wanted to do life-wise? Or are you still trying to decide what you want to do? Because I, I knew your father told me that your father told you a cute story about all of these other vocations that you had really were sort of uh, fertilizer, for want of a better term, for ministry. Um, were you thinking ministry yet, or was that still something <clears> off <throat> down the road? It was on and off. Uh -huh. I had my times, you know, when I would mm -hmm. want it, and my times when I would not even think about it. Mm -hmm. I want to just stop here, uh, because that is such a singular miracle. Sharon says, a miracle is something that happens beyond logic or reason. And that certainly was beyond logic or, or reason. Um... um she says, God doesn't judge a person on the outside. He looks on heart that, uh, for no respect of persons. Um, he visits miracles into our lives so that they may be examples for others around us and bring them closer to God. And, and that certainly fits this, this um, first of many incidences in your life that God would do such a singular, singular uh, miracle um, uh, in your behalf. So thank you, Sharon. Um, Betty says to me, it's the divine intervention of God into my life. Um, and I think it's very, very true. That's Betty from Ohio. It is a divine intervention of God into your life. Um, so you moved to another place and you, 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 you did more glass work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a time in your life when you had to deal with, with going into the service. And I do want to go into that because um, uh, military service was mandatory in Romania, wasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I know there were some differences if you're going to go on to college or if you were not going to go on to college. Walk us through that. Well, <clears throat> I want to specify first that right now it's easy to talk about. Mm -hmm. But every time when we go through challenges, until the miracle happens, it's not easy. Yes. It requires a lot of faith, a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. Faith that we cannot say that we have. Patience that we cannot say that we have. Mm. So it, it, it's kind of... I remember going to my father and saying what to do. And he would say... Mm -hmm. God takes you by hand if you, if you keep his hand, you know, and mm -hmm. he'll say he'll give you strength for the day, every day. Wow. Just, he would say these very words, don't live alone. A day without God is a day that you lose. That you lose, wow. And he said it's a last day for eternity, so never live alone. Mm. So basically for the service, <clears throat> um, you, would, you were not allowed to go to a university before you would be incorporated for service. It's like you would have to go to the commissariat, was called. I don't know if there is a word in English for Commissary. that. Commissary. It's close. Yeah. And they would decide if you are healthy enough to do service or not. And they would give you a paper, incorporable or non-incorporable. Oh, that's a little different. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. If mm -hmm. you, unless you have that paper, mm -hmm. you could not go to any school. Now, yeah. You didn't plan on doing this, but you've got, to, you've got to tell this story. You said that when you told your story of the glass, your father told you a story. Yes. Uh, uh, recount that story, please. Well, he was selling books, canvassing, and that was against the law. Mm -hmm. And they would catch you, you would go to prison for the rest of the life, probably. And um, he was avoiding main roads. And he, together with his friend Benjamin, uh, took, they would go by the road through the forest, and they took, instead of the main bridge, that the police could catch them because people from the previous village, some of them would say, hey, there, there are some people selling religious books. Mm -hmm. So they would have to stay away from the road in order to avoid the police. Mm -hmm. So they took a different bridge that was old, narrow, over a gorge, <clears throat> pretty deep, rocks, water down. And uh, the bridge had pieces of wood, wood boards that were some of them missing, mm -hmm. some of them rotten. So just rotten, some of the boards are just not there. 
No, they were to- gone. Totally yeah. missing. Totally gone. Uh-huh. So you have to be very careful how you step. And they, were, it was evening, as they were talking, uh, Benjamin that was walking behind my father and going slow, called him and said, Pavel, don't move. So my father stopped and looked back, what is it? And he said, look down. And he had, there were like two meters of nothing. The boards were all gone. The, the boards decks were gone, yeah. Were gone. Mm-hmm. And he, it was like he stepped one foot on air, the other one on air, and now it was one foot on wood, and still the foot behind was still on, on air. air. Mm-hmm. And uh, he told me the story. He said, probably God sent his angels to put their palm and hold my foot so I'll not be hurt. Mm-hmm. And he said, the same God put his angels to hold the glass for hold you. Hold that glass for you. Wow. Powerful, powerful, powerful stories. Yes. So this, this idea of God standing up for in, in, and showing himself powerful in your family is, it was not a new thing with you. There, there was some history with that. Um, but you went to the army, and we're going to do some of this stuff in just a moment, but um, you ran into some problems with, with, with army service also. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> um, there are many of them. One of them... Um, I remember asking God to wake me up early in the morning so I would have enough time to pray. I didn't want to start the day without prayer. Mm-hmm. And sure, I didn't have a Bible, but my girlfriend, that is my wife, she would send me letters and she would write paragraphs from the spirit of prophecy, Bible verses, and words of encouragement. And uh, I would pray and God would wake me up early in the morning, like. 5, 4.30, and I would stay under the blanket because I didn't want anybody to see me. And with a a small flashlight, I would read and pray and read and pray and spend spend some time with God. Mm -hmm. And then I would slowly, under the blanket, get dressed, slow, when the trumpet would uh, uh, call soldiers to wake up, Mm -hmm. we would have just a short, extremely short time to get dressed and be in front of the garrison in the front yard, I would always be the first one because I was already dressed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, I remember one specific time I prayed and said, God, please wake me up early enough so I can start the day with you. And uh, God woke me up at 2.30. And I said, come on, this is too early. And I wanted to go back to sleep. And God spoke in my mind and said, didn't you ask me to wake you up? Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, then I'm going to pray study and get dressed. And I got dressed and then I wanted to go back to sleep when the trumpet started to sound and they had a drill. It was like a war uh, alarm. Yes. It was just a drill, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody was sleepy. They, most of them got punished for being late. I was the first one there. (laughs) And uh, so they asked me, what uh, type of reward do you want? A picture with the flag, a few days at home, what do you prefer? <laughs> and sure, I took the days at home. <clears throat> then a different time, we were in, there were floods, so they called the army to go and pick up the corn because the corn was in the water. I remember that story, yes, 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 yes. And I would uh, wake up early every day, and they didn't have a clock, an alarm clock. So the lieutenant asked one soldier to wake everybody up, and he slept longer than anybody else. So then the other one, and then one of the soldiers, his name was Adrian, he told the lieutenant, Goya wakes up early because I asked him, and he said, God is waking him up to pray. Hmm. So if you want somebody to wake us up, Goya can wake us up. <laughs> so the lieutenant said, Goya, can you wake us up tomorrow? I said, yeah. What time? 5.30. I said, okay. How do you wake up? And I said, well, I am praying and God wakes me up. Yeah, sure. Does he talk to you or he would move your shoulder? How does he do it? Uh-huh. And I said, well, you pray and you'll see how. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I would wake them up every day and I told the lieutenant, uh, every day I worked and some of the soldiers would get drunk and some of them would not work. And he would come and check and he would find that on the row that I am on, the corn is picked up faithfully. Mm-hmm. And he would give me as an example every day, you see how he works, you got to work the same. Ah, uh-huh. aha. <clears throat> well, Friday, I went to him and I said, tomorrow I cannot work. It's my day. I worship God. He said, go, go away. There is no God in this country. I said, I'm not going to work. Yes, you will. I'm not going to work. 
Yes, you will. Now you're in the service now. This is not like before. You're, you're under military orders. You are under order. You yeah. don't say no. You say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I said, I'm sorry. I've been obeying and respectful and do whatever you say. But tomorrow is God's day and God is above you. So tomorrow I cannot work. Mm -hmm. He said, you will. I said, respectfully, but I will not. He said, you go to prison. I said, I will. I would rather go to prison. He said, are you crazy? I said, well, I don't know if I am crazy or not. But I said, I want you to know, I will not work. Mm -hmm. And he smiled and he said, if I let you not work, I can lose my job and my freedom. And I said, well, if you let me not work, the God that is going to take care of me is going to take care of you too. Mm. And he looked to me, he called me aside and he said, don't tell anybody. I'm going to let you not work tomorrow. I hope that your God is going to take care of me and my family. And then he asked me to pray for him. That was, his name was Barbulescu. Mm -hmm. Well, after a month, no, after two weeks, sorry, he was called back to the garrison and the new one that was Vulpoi, that in English means fox, he was sent. That guy was a mean guy. He was a tough guy. Tough guy. Yeah, yeah. He didn't care for soldiers. He cared just for himself. Uh -huh. He called us names. He would not even care if we worked. He would make our life miserable. He did see that I work. But when I went to him Friday and said, I don't work tomorrow, he said, I said, you know, I work every day. He said, I don't care that you worked. You work tomorrow. And if you work or not, you go be in between the core like everybody else. <clears throat> I said, I will not. Yes, you will. And I'm going to make you go. And if you go to prison, I'm going to make sure that you have a miserable life, that in prison you work. If not, they will beat you to death until you work. And he said, I'm going to make sure that you do that. Mm. He called me names. He cursed me. He took, I remember, an apple and threw after me. And, <laughs> and he said, I said, I'm not going to work. Get out, get away. He didn't even want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. I prayed the whole night. And I remember I had in my mind that I would have to make a decision. I go to prison or I work. And I asked God for strength. It was not easy. And I made up my mind that I'm not going to work. Yeah. So on Saturday morning, I went to him during breakfast. And I told him, I said, I want to talk to you. Get out. I said, regardless if you listen or not, I'm going to say it. You will ruin my life. I will go to prison. But even if you put your gun, I said, in my head, <clears throat> and you shoot me, I will not work because I love God more than my life. Mm. And he said, you are crazy. And I said, probably. <laughs> but I said, you are going to ruin somebody's life. And I said, I will not work. Mm. And I said, may God be with me. Wow. And he said, you are crazy, aren't you? You are serious, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so you... Are you willing to go to prison? I said, yes, I am. What am I going to do with you? Yeah. Now, I need to just stop here and say, when, you, you, when we talk about prison in Romania, in, in communist times, you're not talking about lounge chair, watching TV, sitting back. You know, some, some of our prisons here in the States can be, uh, having been in prison, it's rough life. But depending on where you go, you're talking about real prison. This is no, no cakewalk. You're talking about I have friends rough times. Yeah. and relatives that went to prison for having Bibles. Yes. And they would be beaten every day, mm. every day. And they stayed in prison until revolution. And I have friends that went to prison for not working Sabbath during the army. Yes. They stayed in prison seven, 10, 11 years, mm -hmm. beaten, extremely, extremely difficult life. Yes. My cousin was in prison. He lost weight that you would not recognize him. Mm. He would wish to die. He, he would tell you the stories you would not even believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Basically, so you knew that's what was waiting for you. I mean, that's, there's no if, answer, but that's what it was going to be. Yes. Yeah. So he said, you are serious? I said, yes, I am. And he called me to come. It was something like a, <clears throat> like a kitchen, not the, not the cafeteria where everybody was eating. Yeah. And he said, listen, tomorrow you will not work, but you will do what I'm asking you to do. So I'm going to, I said, hey, don't ask me to work because I'm not going to work. Hmm. And he said, listen, if I let you not work, the others are going to tell on me and I lose my job and my freedom. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that for you. But he said, I'm going to find a way that they don't know. And when I call on you tomorrow, you better answer. 
<clears throat> well, I said, can I trust you? Because I knew he didn't care for anybody and you could not count on his word. He didn't have a word. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he called me names and he said, get away. If you don't trust me, then I don't even talk to you. I said, well, it's not that I, I don't trust you, but I tell you, don't ask me to work because I will not work. Mm -hmm. Saturday morning, he asked every soldier to take one row of corn. And then he asked me the last one. So I did. I stood up right in front of the, in line like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Now he said, soldiers, go ahead, straight forward, start picking corn. And he was waiting to see what I do. And everybody in line, everybody started to walk straight towards the corn to start working. I didn't move. Mm -hmm. I stood still. And then he looked to me and after a few seconds, he said, Goya, come back. I want you to come here and start a fire for me. I'm cold. Pick up the wood and start a fire. Turned around, went to him. I said, I'm not going to start a fire for you. <laughs> but by this time, soldiers were already entering between the, the rows, yes. rows yes. in the cornfield. Mm -hmm. And he said, he called me names. And then he said, okay, so what are you going to do now? If you stay here, they see that you don't work. Go. And he said to me these very words, evaporate, disappear. I don't want to see you. Come tonight. So I walked into the forest, walked until to the next village. And I asked, where is the Adventist church? And I went to the church. Wow. <clears throat> after the church, some church members took me home and gave me good food. <laughs> and after sunset, after having prayer and everything, went back to the forest. Yes. And he said, so how was your day? I said, it was great. Mm. I said, if you touch something, I will make your life miserable. Don't tell anybody anything. Mm. So the soldier who come, soldiers who come to me, so he called you back. Yes, he did. What did he ask you to do? I said, well, I cannot tell you. Wow. Was it bad? I said, well, I cannot tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and they never knew. <clears throat> and they never knew. Same second Sabbath. However, the, after a month of corn, we went back to the garrison mm -hmm. for instruction. And it was a different one that was in the Communist Party. Tufan was his name. Mm -hmm. He was a mean man. He was shameless, godless, and almost like demon possessed. He mm. was extremely, extremely bad. Mm. He came to me and said, I know who you are. I know what you do. I know what you talk. I know what you eat at home. I know every second of your, your life. I know what you talk in the house. And he said, I'll make you eat pork. I'll make you drink. Mm. I'll make you work Saturdays. I'll make you curse God. If not, I will terminate your life, mm. not just your freedom. I'll make sure that you don't live here. Isn't it interesting how the Lord allowed you to go over this ground again and again and again, mm. and how the devil put extremely belligerent, mean-spirited, anti-God people in, in your path, and yet God proved himself faithful every every time and when you when you read the book you you almost can't wait to get through one miracle one story to get to the next one because there is this consistent god showing himself powerful each and every time so you go from one bad guy to a worse bad guy now to a worse bad guy so walk us through that <clears throat> that story i remember my father saying the greater the challenge the greater the miracle yes. as long as you are in god's hands mm -hmm. Now, this guy called me to, meanwhile, some things happened. Meanwhile, soldiers used to steal from the storage room compasses, shoes, tools, and sell them to buy alcohol. Mm -hmm. And they would ask this soldier to, to, to guard, to, to protect, and he himself would steal, and then For they would sure, ask yes. a different <laughs> one. Eventually, <laughs> my friend Adrian, went to them and said, if you ask Goya, nothing is going to disappear. This guy is honest. Mm. So they asked me to oversee the storage room. And when the soldiers would come for fresh sacks, I would say, you bring back the ones that you stole in the morning and I give you new ones. So things started to come back <clears throat> and nothing disappeared anymore. Mm -hmm. And then something happened that the, the, the driveway was broken. It was paved with nice stones like uh, square. I don't know how to call them. Very nice, you see in old cities. In oh, like cobblestones, we yes. call them. Yes, 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 yes. And they didn't know how to fix it, and I fixed the driveway. Uh -huh. And then I remember the museum. It was a very old garrison built in 1500s by one of the kings, way hundreds of years before. Mm -hmm. So Alexander John 
Kuza was the name or of the of the garrison. So they asked somebody to fix the museum and they didn't know. So I did it. And all the old weapons and swords and things, I covered them in glass, made kind of boxes of glass, uh -huh. covered all the old inscriptions and just by God's grace, I made it beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then the thing that holds the curtains over the, com the commander, the, the chief of the whole garrison, yes. over the door, that broke and almost fell on onto his head and almost hit him, you know? Mm -hmm. So nobody knew how to fix it, and I did it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there were several things that happened that God used me to, to help there, you know? Mm -hmm. So eventually, one Sabbath, during some Sabbaths I would hide in the bathroom. During some Sabbaths I would find a way to escape. But mm -hmm. one Sabbath, he specifically called me, and then... Uh, put me in front of the other soldiers and ordered me to dig a hole in the ground. And I talked to him and I said, listen, I'll not do it. Please don't ask me to do it because if you would ask me privately, it would be a punishment. But if you would order me in front of the whole um, company, we call it, yes. that, that would be a lot worse punishment to disregard his command. Mm -hmm. And so he said, I'm going to get you in front of everybody, make you do it. If not, I'm going to get the most difficult, the hardest punishment for you. And see, so he asked me to step forward and to dig a hole in the ground and hide from enemy. <clears throat> there was no enemy, but it yeah. was an order. Mm -hmm. And instead of when he said that I should dig a, a hole in the ground, I didn't move. So he ordered me again and I didn't move. Mm. And he ordered me again and he started to lose his temper. And he started to scream and to get foam at his mouth. Hmm. He's angry. Extreme, yes. extreme uh, anger. And he screamed and he said, you disobey and disregard me in front of the other soldiers. I'll make you pay for it. And screaming, he left us there. He called all the officers of the garrison. And he proposed capi uh, uh, maximum punishment. During the war would be the capital punishment. Yes. However, during the peace, would be seven to 14 years prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'd just shoot you on the spot. In, in wartime, you just obey an order. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, but now it's prison. So I left the training field, went to the uh, storage room, locked myself inside, and started to pray. And in the beginning, I was asking God for help to protect me. Mm. But as I was praying, it came to my mind that God should be the priority, God's honor, God's name, and that I should ask that whatever happens, just that he would give me strength mm. and peace and faith. Amen. So I was praying for faith. And as I was praying, he gave me peace. Praise I remember God. I started to read paragraphs that my girlfriend sent me and started to sing songs. <laughs> and as I was praying, somebody knocks in the door. It was a sergeant. His name was Chuchu Vasile. No, I'm sorry, Chuchu Marian. I'm, I'm, it's a long time since. Yes. He was a short guy, funny guy. So I opened the door and he said, Pavel, I want you to be on, honest with me. So I am honest with you. Do you know General Voikiza? I said, I don't know the general. He was one of the generals of the four armies of Romania. He uh -huh. was extremely big. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the general happened that he, he came without announcing, to check, to inspect our garrison. Uh -huh. When he came to inspect, he visited the museum and he noticed that it's all covered in glass. And he visited that and that and that and that. So all the work you had done all the time, the general seeing all of this stuff. What I didn't know. Yeah, I was just one of the top guys in the country, not just your little unit. One of the four big guys in the, in the country. In the whole country. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they had a meeting. And so the surgeon says to me, you sure you don't know the general? No. You don't know anybody in the Central Committee, the Communist Party? Yeah. I said, no. You don't know anybody there? No. I said, wow. I said, why? And he says, this is what happened. The general came from Bucharest to inspect the garrison. And they wanted, they said, we have an emergency meeting. We have to punish a guy. I said, well, before we do that, let's first get done with the inspection. Yes. And he said, I noticed that you did that. Who did the museum? And they said, oh, Goya. 
<laughs> I noticed that you got the driveway. Who did the driveway? Uh, Goya. Goya. <laughs> what about the storage room? It's clean and in order, and before all the shovels were dirty. Right now they are clean. And who did it? Goya. Goya. <laughs> mm, after they talked about everything, he says, "Okay, who is the guy that you want to punish?" And they said, "It's Goya." Goya. <laughs> and he said, "Why would you punish him? What did he do?" fighting, getting drunk. Is he against the country, against the Communist Party? And they said, no, he doesn't get involved in politics. It's just that he doesn't work Saturdays. Does he work the other days? Yeah, he works pretty hard every day. Is he honest? Yes, he is. Does he do proselytism, propaganda, religious propaganda? No. Then what do you, what do you have against him? Don't you wish that you had everybody like him? Mm -hmm. If he's ready to die for his God, don't you think that he would be ready to die for his country too? These are the people that never betray us. We wish we'd have more people like him. Yes. And he said, you touch him, you lose your jobs. Uh oh. You touch him, you go against me. He said, don't touch this guy. All right. So the sergeant said, so you don't know him? I said, no, I don't. It was hard for me to even believe. Hmm. But after he left, Barbulescu, the guy that was in the first two weeks at Cornfield, yes. he came and says, Pavel, do you know the general? I said, no, I don't know him. You don't lie, you cannot lie. You are an Adventist. I said, no, I don't lie. <laughs> he told me the same story. So basically, after that, lieutenants and others and captains would come to me and say, hey, Pavel, don't you want to go to church? Yes, I want. You are free to go. Don't you want to go home? Yes, I want. You are free to go. Just call the general and tell him that we take good care of you. <laughs> they didn't believe that I don't even if know him. You don't him. know him, yes. Yeah. yes. So basically from that day on, I had the best life among all soldiers there. Yes. I ate good food. I would go out anytime I wanted, go home anytime, mm. go to church every Sabbath. Mm. They never asked me to work Saturdays again. Yeah. They would try to protect me so the general would be happy. That is powerful. God answered the prayer of Solomon. He gave you what you wanted and what you didn't even ask for. Someone took up your cause who you did not even know. Uh, that's how powerful God is. That is an incredible story. I saw that in the book, uh, 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 one of the great miracles in the book. So. I think we'll stop here while we are catching our breath and go to some to some music. Um, we've got some more of these stories. They are fabulous. And I want to commend you just saw the, the graphic of the book. Uh, go to your ABC and, and get we don't push books that much. But this is not just a book. This is the working of God in a life. And uh, it will encourage the Bible does say that a, a good report makes your bones fat. So we are Papa, we are we are fattening ourselves up tonight on some really wonderful stories. Um, Tim Herbert returns, uh, and this sort of fits in with where we're going and what we're talking about, to ask the question, who am I? Well, we're God's children, and when uh, we stand up for him, he does indeed stand up for us. Tim Herbert sings now, Who Am I? When I think of how he came so far from glory, came and dwelt among the lowly, such as I. And such disgrace on Mount Calvary take my place. Then I ask myself one question Who am I? to an old 
rugged cross he'd go Greg Budd um, said to me, C.A., you've got to get Pavel to talk about the many, many story. It's a chapter in the book. Do you recall what that one was about? Mm -hmm. Many, many. Tell us what that story is all about. <coughs> that, that evidently is Greg's favorite or one of the most powerful ones. But just walk us through that particular story. Many, many. That's not his real name. Uh -huh. He was one of the children. In, he was not a child. He was 19 years old, but he looked like a child. <clears throat> because he was short, mm. um, he had quite a few disabilities. He was handicapped. Uh -huh. He was unable to speak well. He was unable to walk well. He would walk sideways, not use properly his right hand and his right leg. Uh, from an extremely poor family, he was uh, begging on the streets. He had many accidents. One time, a car hit him by the marketplace. One time a bicycle hit him in the train station. Mm. He would uh, not look left and right. When he would cross the street, he would just run somehow. Yes. And uh, so <clears throat> anyway, I remember coming from my sister driving the car, getting home and planning to get gas and the next day morning to go to the conference for the meeting, for the pastoral meeting. Mm -hmm. It was a crisis in the country. There was no gas. So you'd stay in long lines to get gas. Mm -hmm. And the gas was limited. It was a ratio. You would get so much gas a sure. month. Yeah. And basically, I knew that if I wait until the morning, I may never get in time to the pastoral meeting. So I would have to go now and get gas. And then, so <clears throat> there was no gas station within the town. It would be outside the town limits. The night before, I had a dream. And usually I thought I never dream. I thought just my mom dreams. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> I would sleep so hard that I probably would not remember the dreams. But that night I woke up crying because in my dream I hit a child with my car 
and he had blood all over coming and mm. I woke up and I told my wife what I dreamed. Well, that day after I got home, <clears throat> my wife was cooking, cleaning. I got in the car and went to the gas station. As I was exiting the city, there are two curves, it's like an S on mm -hmm. the road. Yes. And you cannot see what is behind because of the trees. Yes. And everybody was driving extremely slow. In front of all the cars, there was a horse pulled wagon and the wagon was filled up with wood for fire. Mm -hmm. And the horse pulled wagon was going so slow. Yes. And no car could pass because they would not see what comes on the other side, coming the, at you, towards you. Yes, yes exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they would have to wait. And after the two curves finally pass when they had visibility. Mm -hmm. Well, so I put, I had a stick shift. So I put the car in first or second gear and go slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember after the curves, cars started to pass. So when I got to the, the next one behind the wagon, I passed, changed in the second, changed in the third gear, and there were cars coming from the other direction on this two-lane road. Yes. It was a truck that came, and when the truck was parallel with my car, from behind the truck, Mene Mene jumped right in front of my car. Wow. So probably after the truck passed, he started to run. Yes. Never thought about the car coming the other direction. Never thought about exactly. Yes, yes. And he didn't jump two meters ahead or one meter or right in front of the bumper. I didn't even have time to push the brake. Mm. Hit him. He hit him full, full force, no Oof. foot on the brake at all. And then I pushed the brake, but it was after I hit him. Yes, you hit him, yeah. <clears throat> he went up, he came down, and the car, while stopping, hit him again. Oh. And threw him by the side of the road, mm -hmm. and he also hit the curb of the side of the road. When you had your dream the night before, did it happen as you saw in your dream, or fairly close? So you saw it pretty much as it happened? Exactly. My soul. And so, <clears throat> I didn't know what to do, stopped there. A few cars stopped. In that time, if you would wait for the ambulance, I'm sorry to say, but the pizza car would come faster than the ambulance, you know. Mm. They would never come, so usually what people did in that time, they would put uh, him in the car and Just run, take him, yes. Run, put him carefully, run him to hospital. Yes. So somebody stopped, I remember an old red car, got him in the car, run him to hospital in that town, called Red Steel, because it was a steel factory there. Steel factory, yes, yes. And um, from that town, it happens that one of the doctors, one of the physicians, was my neighbor. Mm. And they looked at him and they said, <clears throat> we cannot deal with him, it's too, uh, uh, how to say, too, the damage is too big. Too great, yes. Too great. Yes, yes, yes. So they put him in an ambulance, rushed him, to the next city that was bigger, to Karan Sebesh. And there they said, uh, we should send him to Timisoara, to the biggest city in, in that area. However, they said it may be too late. Mm. They did the x-ray, and I remember specifically, when they put them on a, like a box that has glass, and behind the glass some lights that you can see the x-ray, mm -hmm. and they put the x-ray, and I remember specifically doctor saying, brain hemorrhage, spine broken in two places, mm. right lung broken, and hemorrhage in his lung, arm broken, shoulder and hip both broken, and leg broken in two places. How fast were you going when you, when you impacted him? Do you, do you have any idea? Around 50 to 55 kilometers per hour. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But the impact was so short and so strong that... Yes, yes, yes. It was not that I, I didn't have time to slow down at all, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I hit him twice. Yes, yes. The other things, the hand, the shoulder, the leg, um, the hip, they would uh, heal the problem with the brain, the spine, 
and the lung, that was the worst one. Yes, yes. Because he could not breathe. Uh, it was blood in his lung and you could hear him gargle into his own blood, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they put him to life support. And in just short time, the, the, the heart. Yeah, the flat line, they call it here, yes. Yeah. Flat line came and yes. uh, they checked his pulse and he had no blood pressure, no pulse. The heart stopped and they just covered him. Mm -hmm. I remember the doctor declaring him dead, you know. Can I ask you at this moment, because I've read the end of the story, what were you feeling just now? You'd, you'd hit somebody, it wasn't your fault, really, but that doesn't <clears throat> free you from the, the trauma of, in, of having... In the beginning, I, I was calm. But as time would go by, I started to shake, and I started to think about it, and I, uh, I had in my mind that I would rather die myself than to know that I took somebody's life. Yes. I could not, I could not bear it. And uh, I started to think about me being a pastor and people being so um, superstitious, you know, and mm -hmm. sometimes so, so much prejudice around. People saying the Adventist pastor killed that kid, you yes, know. Yes, and, yes, 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 yes. Um, so I started to pray and I remember one of the doctors, some of them knew me there, and one of them coming and saying, Pastor, it's not your fault. Nobody's going to do anything against you. It doesn't help to pray anymore. You could have prayed when he was alive. Right now, it's too late. There were nurses, there were doctors there, everybody trying to save his life. And he says, right now, it's too late. He's dead. Nobody's going to bring him uh, back. Not even God can bring him back. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. What I don't agree, because God is the one who <laughs> gives us life after all. Uh, yes, He's yes, the creator, yes, you know? Yes. Well, <clears throat> they asked me to leave. They said, no reason to stay here anymore. He's dead. I went home, and my wife and I prayed the whole night. We did not sleep a second. Mm. And we prayed like never before to the point that I said, God, if you want, take my life and give it to him, just please work for your name's sake, work that people will not talk against the church. Now that's what I was gonna ask you, what was the burden of your prayer? Because he, he's been declared dead. Are you praying for him, for yourself, that God's name be glorified? You're up all night, you're agonizing with God. What, what's the focus? What are you praying for specifically? I was struggling with all of them, uh -huh. all of the above. Mm -hmm. I was struggling with the fact that I killed somebody, and I was struggling with the fact that the church is going to suffer because of me, mm -hmm. and God's name is going to be... Uh, I don't know how to say it in English. Yeah. Misrepresented or... Mm -hmm. Well, we, we'd say dragged in the mud. Dragged, thank you, dragged yes. in the mud. Yeah. And uh, so I prayed for all of the above. Mm -hmm. And basically I said, God, just find a way that the church is not going to be criticized over the news, over the papers, over the, you know, and it's not going to affect the church and your name will not be, and you know, you will work in this area. And, mm. and I basically, I pleaded with God and uh, prayed the whole night, mm -hmm. literally prayed hard. I remember one more time I prayed that when my son had an accident just two years ago, the same, you know. So I actually, <coughs> excuse me, my wife and I prayed the whole night until morning. And uh, in the morning I went back to hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in the bed sitting and eating. Mm -hmm. And the, the doctors were talking that when the men came in the morgue in the morning, found him sitting on that cold table, concrete table, mm -hmm. and the guy started to run and <laughs> called others. And they, <laughs> they came and uh, they, they decided that he had clinical death or a very deep coma. I don't know how you call it. I don't mm -hmm. know what that is. But anyway, that he was not totally dead. But the problem they had was the x-ray. They would analyze the yesterday x-ray and today's x-ray. X-ray, yes. And yes. they would say, you can see it here, brain damage and hemorrhage. There is no brain damage here. Broken spine, there is no broken spine here. Mm. Broken lung and hemorrhage, there is no broken lung and hemorrhage here. Yet his bones were still broken, the hand, yes. hip, shoulder, and leg. Yes, <clears throat> but the, 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 the life-threatening 
serious stuff was gone. <laughs> Moreover, yes. the big problem was that they could not explain is this. He could never talk before. He was um, a... Um, he was a mute. He, he, he could not speak. He, he did speak, but he was a... I forgot the name when you say... But, 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 but you, you know, when you repeat... Uh, uh, oh, he stuttered. Stuttered. He stuttered, yes. Thank yes, you. Yes. I, the word didn't come to me. He was a stutterer. Mm -hmm. And even the words that he said, you, they were not clear. You, yes. You could not make sense. You could not understand him. Mm -hmm. He was speaking clear and nice. Oh, so oh, God made him oh, better than oh. before. Glory to God. Not only did the Lord repair him, he improved him. Uh, praise God. The whole town, I mean, the news went so fast. I'm sure. We did evangelism. The church was packed. <laughs> 44 people got baptized. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> the whole town was talking. I remember it was a crisis. You could not find anything. I went to the grocery store. I was looking for oil to cook for canola, vegetable oil. Mm -hmm. And they had no oil. And I remember the lady from the cashier, like, she called the manager and said, called her by name, I don't remember the name, and said, can you get for the Adventist pastor some oil from the back, from the storage that we have for ourselves? <laughs> he can pray for you too, you know? <laughs> God truly glorified himself in that, in that incident. Um, that's the kind of thing, the kind of empirical evidence that, that just defies logic. That, that's a miracle. You've got a brain hemorrhage the night before, the next morning it is gone. I, I cannot help but say this. The same God that split the sea before. Yes. And did so many miracles in the Bible. Mm -hmm. He never changed. No. And he is here to work through us, to use us, to help us. Yes. And many times we don't even have the courage to ask more than we can do ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very true. And many times we don't trust him enough. And mm. it's like the paragraph that says that we should ask him big things, not small things. Yes, yes. And this is a big thing. This is a big thing. And I think, I think the focus of your prayer was, Lord, glorify your name. Just glorify your name. Um, you know, show yourself powerful in these things. And, of course, when you ask that, that prayer, that's the kind of prayer that God's got to answer uh, for his own glory. Um, what a powerful, you know, every, I've read that story initially. I ran across it again today uh, in preparing for this show. And every time I, it, 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 it sends chills up and down my spine. Um, it just... It makes you so humble that we serve a God who will go to those lengths. Uh, this, this kid was gone and God brought him back and improved his speech. What a wonderful, powerful witness testimony <clears throat> for the church and for the love of the Lord. And of course, for, for baptisms, uh, that's, that, that's proof enough. Powerful. I've read this book twice. Uh, once quite a bit ago and, and, and sort of skimmed through it today. It, it, Tell me a story that's not in the book, because I know things are happening even to, to this day, but outside of it, because this book is, is one point in your life. Your life goes on. Uh, you're pastoring today, successfully pastoring, something that's not in the book. There are several of them. <clears throat> I want to give one that is a little funny about our grand caravan, about our car. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I remember we... Uh, decided we are not going to ask God for anything that we don't use for him. Yes. So if we would buy a car, we would pray that we would use that car primarily for God and then for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we we'll get a house, we would use the, God, the house first for God. And we will never ask God for anything that we cannot use for him. And for instance, we got our first furniture. Church members would come over. They would come with children. Children would jump on the new couch. I would get my ears red. My wife would know when my ears are red, it means I am tense. So <laughs> she would call me in the kitchen and she would say, calm down. And I would say, don't you see the children? They jump with the shoes on on our new couch. Yes. And my wife would say, didn't we pray that our primary use would be for God? Aren't these children more important than our couch? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't you want to gain their friendship and to save them and their parents more than to save your couch? Aha. Uh -huh. And I would say, honey, you are right. So my ears would cool down. <laughs> I would go back to the living room and just pretend I don't see it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, some of the parents mentioned that and they said, we cannot believe how much you love our children, how patient you are. Mm -hmm. They didn't know the story. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> the same with the car. 
we got a, a Dodge Grand Caravan mm -hmm. that we pray that we use it for God. Mm -hmm. We basically used it more for my wife's job. Uh -huh. Not much for the church. Mm -hmm. And somehow the transmission broke. We got a second-hand transmission, paid the labor, paid the transmission, got it fixed. Mm -hmm. Just three months later, it broke again. again. <laughs> I hated the car. <laughs> I mean, who wants to spend so much money? If I sold the car, I would not recover that money. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got a new transmission again, mm -hmm. second-hand, mm -hmm. paid the labor again, fixed it again. And I said, I'm not going to use the car again. Yes. Put it for sale. Hopefully somebody's gonna buy it. Yes, yes, yes. And I started to pray, God, help me sell the car. Help me sell the car. Nobody called. Like, everybody knew that my car has a bad transmission. Mm -hmm. Nobody called. After two months, put it in the newspaper, put it on the cable, on Craigslist, put even on the windshield a paper that is for sale. Yeah. Lower the price. Nobody called. <laughs> I got so upset. And I remember coming to my mind what my father said, that whatever is not for God should not even exist in our life. Mm. That we have no reason to live if we don't live for God. And it came in my mind, you want to sell the van, but you do it for yourself. So I was driving the van from Beloit to Janesville, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Started to pray a different prayer. I said, God, I'm not gonna ask you to sell the van. I'm gonna ask you one of the two things. If, it's, if it sells, give it to somebody who is going to use it for you. Yes. If it doesn't, help me from now on to use it for you first. Yes. And then for ourselves. Yes. I finished the prayer. 15, 20 seconds. My cell phone ringed. Hmm. It was one of my church members. <laughs> <clears throat> she said, Pastor, do you still have that van? I said, yes, I do. And I, I, she says, I want to buy the van. I said, well, you know that the trans, I had some transmission problems. Mm -hmm. said, I know, I know. Don't worry about it. I said, why would you buy the van? And she said, I want to drive people to evangelism who don't have transportation. Oh, And she had God. the Dodge Neon, that uh -huh. was a small car. Yes, yes. She said, there is no room in my car. I want to drive children to school, so I want to use it for God, and for I God. need a van. Yes. And she said, how much you want? I said, well, that's the price. But I said, how much you have? I said, I have this money, and that was kind of half of my price. Uh -huh. But I said, listen, pay whatever you have. That would be enough. She was happy, and I trusted the Lord. I was happy with it. Mm -hmm. Many years after, the car didn't break again. <laughs> <laughs> the car kept going and going. <laughs> because it was in the Lord's hands now. So it didn't break down again. Praise God. That is a fabulous story. Uh, God is so good. I want to, before our time gets away, because I'm looking at the clock and we're, we're slipping away. You have talked a number of times tonight about your wife. Tell me a little about, she must have been a woman of great faith. How did you meet her? <laughs> this is a long story. I, I put my eyes on her when she was three years old and I was six years old. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good early start. <laughs> and I said I like her and I would like to marry her. And basically, mm. uh, my sister would say, you don't know what you talk. You are going to change your mind many yes, times. Yes, yes. Well, I kept watching her and... Uh, when we were in about, I don't remember, sophomore or whatever in high school, mm -hmm. I started to talk to her. And um, I remember one time I had a handkerchief that I used some spray like Giorgio Armani that uh -huh. I didn't use. I kept it just for her. I noticed her crying and I just gave her the handkerchief and oh. <clears throat> somehow got her attention. Smooth guy. <clears throat> but this is what uh, happened. I remember I would Purposely, when she would go to school, I would make sure that I go in the same time so we would walk together to school. Ah, okay. And I started to talk to her about my experience with God. Mm. And I would say, what do you study? And she would say, I don't study. Though she would go to church. And I would tell her what I study. The books from the Spirit of Prophecy, the Bible, and what God is doing for me and how God is, works in my life, in my father's life. And she would listen, and we got closer and closer friends to the point that we started to meet and study and pray together. Praise God. And she started to study alone. And we would, everyone at his house, study at the same time. We'd wake up at 5.30, mm -hmm. pray in the same time, study in the same time, uh -huh. same book, same chapters. I see, we together. And then right. we would meet in the garden of the school mm -hmm. and share our thoughts. Praise God. Now, Pavel, I want to stop you because 
as good as this story is, I want to get your contact information up because, again, you've heard this, this, <coughs> this wonderful story, series of wonderful miracles. You may want him to come to speak to your group. You certainly will want to get information on how to get this book. Um, just a wonderful story, a wealth of information, and, and really something that will encourage you as you walk with the Lord and meet the struggles of each day, knowing that God is with you. Should you want to make contact with Pastor Pavel Goyo, here is how you can do precisely that. If you would like to contact Pavel to invite him to your church to speak, then you can write to Pavel Goya, 385 Reading Road, Apartment 177, Lexington, Kentucky, 40517. That's Pavel Goya, 385 Reading Road, Apartment 177, Lexington, Kentucky, 40517. You can also email him at pgoia777 at gmail.com. That's pgoia777 at gmail.com. Call or write to him today. He'd love to hear from you.